Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on prioritizing technical depth as if time and money matters. And this is a broad topic, so let's jump right in and have a look at some of the challenges we need to balance when building software at scale. And these challenges are well captured in something known as Lehman's Laws of Software Evolution. And there are multiple laws, and I just want to present two of them for you here and see if they resonate with your experience. So the first law of software evolution is the law of continuing change. And this is where Lehman claims that the system has to continuously adapt and evolve or it will become progressively less useful over time. Is this something you recognize? Yeah. This is the very reason why we keep adding new stuff, why we keep adding new features to our existing code bases, because a successful product is never done. What I wanted to do now is to notice that there is some kind of tension, some kind of conflict to the second law of software evolution, and that is the law of increasing complexity. And this law claims that when our system evolves, its complexity will increase unless we actively try to reduce it. What's so challenging here is that when we fail to reduce complexity, what's going to happen is that responding to change is becoming harder and harder and harder. So this is a vicious circle. And the problem is that if we end up in that circle, we might not even notice. Because what we tend to see are symptoms, not the root cause. And to make it worse, we tend to see different symptoms depending on who we are, what our role is in the organization. So as product people or technical leaders, what we tend to see is this. We tend to see symptoms on the product roadmap execution, right? So if we could do a feature in one week or a year ago, it might take us one month now, right? And these cycle times get longer and longer. They also tend to introduce unpredictability. So software estimation was always a black art. But with longer and longer lead times, increasing complexity, it becomes virtually impossible. What we also tend to see is an impact on the team. So we tend to see a pretty high staff turnover, because working in an extremely complex code base is no fun. We also tend to see key personal dependencies. So you know, those parts of the code that only that one person knows, and that one person happens to be on vacation for two weeks, right? Finally, what our end users tend to see is this. They tend to experience bugs. That is an impact on the external quality of our code. And the real root causes tend to remain hidden, opaque, and obscure, because code, and technical depth in particular, lacks visibility. Now, if we have a problem like technical depth that can really destroy our business, Shouldn't we try to bring visibility to it? There have been multiple approaches over the year, and I want to show you one fairly common approach. The first time I came across this was a couple of years ago, and the idea here was to use static code analysis technique, basically scanning the code, looking for potential violations of predefined rules, and have a cost associated with each one of those violations, and sum it up, and you end up with a number on how high your technical depth is. Has anyone ever tried that? A few of you, maybe 20, 30 people, cool. So the first time I came across this was a client that I visited in London maybe 10 years ago. And what they had done prior to my arrival was that they had used one of these tools capable of quantifying technical depth. And they have taken this tool and thrown it at their 15-year-old code base. And this tool happily reported that on your 15-year-old code base, you have accumulated 4,000 years of technical depth. 4,000 years of technical depth. Let me put that into perspective for you. 4,000 years ago, that was here. That's the start of recorded history for the invention of writing. So, you know, when I tell that story, I'm always super curious, what kind of programming language did they use? Fortran? Lisp? On a more serious note, I do understand that a lot of that depth probably grew in parallel by having hundreds of engineers work on the code base, right? So it might actually be accurate. We don't know. There's no way of telling, right? But is it actionable? What do we do with that information? So what I wanted to show you by explaining this was that quantifying technical depth, it might be an interesting exercise. It's almost always depressing, but it's simply not actionable. <laughs> 
More important, technical depth cannot be prioritized from code alone. What we see in the code, the time to fix, or code smell or fix or flaw, that's not the cost of your technical depth. That's the remediation time, right? The actual cost of technical depth is the additional time it takes to work on that code. And that's something that's simply invisible in the code itself. So we clearly need to look beyond code here. And this is important because we are always going to have this challenge that we saw in Lehman's Law, that there's always going to be a trade-off between improving existing code versus adding new features. And it's a trade-off that's going to shift over time. So we do need to prioritize, but how can we do that? I've spent the past decade trying to address this problem, and I've written about it at length in my books, Software Design X-rays being the latest one. And the techniques I use is something I call behavioral code analysis. So what is a behavioral code analysis? Well, the core idea in behavioral code analysis is it's, that it's always about code and people. So the code is obviously important, but it's even more important to understand how we, as a development organization, are interacting with the software we are building. So if we want to try this out, the first thing we need is obviously behavioral data of us as software developers. And the good news are that you all already have all the data you need. We're just not used to think about it that way. I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the version control system. So version control is something I've been fascinated with for a long, long time. And yes, I know, we all have our odd hobbies. This one happens to be mine. And the reason I'm fascinated by version control is that for decades, we have used version control as more or less an overly complicated backup system, and then occasionally as a collaboration tool. But in doing so, we have built up a wonderful data source of how we, as an organization, have built our code base. So version control data is a virtual goldmine that tells the story of how our system evolved. And this is a data source that we can tap into to prioritize technical depth. Let's try to make this specific. And I want to show you how I use these techniques in a real-world code base. And this is going to be a code base that some of you might actually carry around in your pocket as I speak. Because I'm talking about Android. More specifically, I'm talking about the part of Android known as the Platform Framework Base. And this is a huge code base. What you see on screen here is roughly 3 million lines of code most of it developed in Java by more than 2,000 developers. So this is really a massive code base. The visualization that you see is something that I call a hotspot analysis. And I'm going to walk you through the visualization so that you know what you see. First of all, if you look at those large circles, the ones that blink on screen right now, each one of those circles correspond to a top-level folder in that Git repo. So if this was your code base, you would recognize the names of those circles as important subsystems or high-level components, right? It's a visualization that always, always follows the structure of your code. It's also interactive, so I can zoom in to any level of detail that I'm interested in, and I can inspect the subfolders, and once I get to the lowest level of detail, I see that each file with source code is visualized as a circle. And you see that the circles, they have different size. So size is used to reflect an interesting property. Size is used to reflect code complexity. So what is code complexity? It's basically how hard is that code for a human to understand. And I'm going to tell you in a minute what I use to measure co code complexity. But before I do that, I really have to point out, it's my responsibility to point out, that when managing technical depth, code complexity is actually the least, and I repeat, it's the least interesting dimension. Because complexity has this property that it's only really a problem when we have to deal with it. So maybe I have overly complicated code, but I haven't touched it for years. I should probably focus my attention elsewhere. And this is where we can pull out data from our version control history and get specific advice on how frequently do we work with that code. So I'm going to version control, I'm pulling out things like the number of commits, I sum them up, and the more commits to a piece of code, the more red it becomes. And from a technical depth perspective, the interesting thing is the intersection between these two dimensions. 
Because now we're capable of identifying complicated code that we have to work with often. And those are our hotspots in code. All right, I promised to talk a little bit about code complexity. And this is a, a fascinating co topic because code complexity in itself is really complicated. In fact, there's a highly relevant research paper that I've taken a lot of inspiration from. It's a pretty old paper, but I think it hasn't lost any relevance over the years. And what this paper tells us in the first paragraph is basically that we are doomed if we look for a single metric to capture a multifaceted concept like code complexity. There is no such thing. So what I did instead was that I took a lot of inspiration from the second paragraph here that says that a more promising approach is to identify separate and specific attributes of complexity, measure these separately, and then aggregate. And we decided to call this concept code health, because we can now ask questions like, we have health face our code, and we avoid the whole idea of using a term like code quality, which, which I never really like, because it kind of suggests an absolute. And the way it works with code health is that we identify 20 to 25 different factors, depending on program language. And these are factors that are known from research to correlate with increased maintenance costs and increased risk for defects. So we sample these separately, we stick a probe into any hotspot, we look at what comes out, we combine, weight, aggregate, and normalize these values. And just to give you an idea on what type of things we look for, so these are some very common code health issues that you tend to find in most code bases. So we have things like low cohesion. So what is that? You know, it's simply when you have a class and you have stuffed way too many responsibilities into that class. So now as a developer, when I try to understand that code, I need to be familiar with multiple concepts. And there's also the risk for things like unexpected feature interactions, which are some of the worst bugs that you can ever have. Then you have brain classes, which are classes that are not only low on cohesion, but they also include something known as a brain method. Brain methods are also known as GUD functions. And a GUD function is simply these overly complicated functions. They have a lot of logic in them. They tend to be pretty large in terms of lines of code. And they are very central to the module, so that each time you want to add or modify something in the module, you end up in a brain method. And over time, they become even more complicated. Then we have classics like copy-pasted code, nested logic, and so on. Anyway, once we have measured all of these things, combined them, then you can also start to visualize. And you can do that by categorizing code into one of three different categories. So I typically use colors for this, because colors are known to kind of tap into one of the most powerful pattern detectors that we have in the known universe, and that's our visual brain. So looking at a code base like this, I can quickly tell, is my code green and healthy, meaning it's easy to understand, easy to maintain? Or is it red, meaning that I've accumulated severe technical depth in that part of the code? Now, what I find interesting is that those two perspectives that you have seen so far, one quality perspective, the code health perspective, and the hotspot perspective, the behavioral dimension, none of these are enough in isolation to manage technical depth. We need to combine them. And the way it works is that Using a complexity metric like code health, we can identify the part of our code with technical depth. Adding the human perspective, the behavioral perspective with hotspots, we know the relevance of each one of these findings. And that is what let us prioritize technical depth. And you're going to see a little bit more data on this soon. But to me, this combination is really, really key. Because finding bad code is really the easy part, right? The hard part is to know which part to fix. And this is where hotspots send a positive message. And I want to explain this to you. So please look carefully, because this is probably the most important slide in this session. So what you see here on screen is that on the x-axis, you have each file in a particular system. In this case, it's Android. And those files are sorted according to the change frequency. That is, the number of commits you have done to that specific file. And the number of commits is what you see on the y-axis. If you look at this graph, you see that it's a very typical Pareto distribution, right? A power, dis power law distribution. And this is really important, because this is not something that's unique to Android. This is something I found in every single code base that I've ever analyzed, 
and I probably have analyzed around three, 400 code bases by now. So this seems to be the way software evolves. And this is good news to us, because what it means is that most of our code is going to be in the long tail. So it's code that's rarely, if ever, touched. And that's the part of the code where we can actually live with a certain degree of technical depth. We want to know about it because it might be a future risk, but it's most likely not an urgent concern. On the other hand, most of our development activity is in a very small part of the code base, the part identified by the hotspots. And that's the part of the code where even a minor amount of technical depth can quickly become really, really expensive due to the high change frequency. All right, let's dig a little bit deeper into our Android hotspot. The number one hotspot in Android that you saw in the visualization, the interactive visualization that I showed you earlier, is called Activity Manager Service. Isn't that a wonderful name? Right? One of my favorites. Because first we have activity, which could be anything. Then we have two words, manager and service. And each one of those words in isolation signals a unit with low cohesion. Now we combine them, and we combine that with the fact that we have 20,000 lines of code in a single file. Who wants to refactor this? Not so many volunteers. And that's good, because I would strongly advise against it. Because refactoring code at this scale is going to be a huge risk, right? So how can we slay this legacy code monster? What I do when I come across a complex hotspot like this is that I use a technique called Hotspots X-Ray. The way it works is that I take that code, I parse it into separate functions, and then I look at the Git log and I see where do each commit hit over time, right? And I sum it up so that I get functions so I get hotspots at the function level. And this is what I use to get a specific starting point for my refactorings. Let's have a look at our X-ray of Activity Manager Service. We see here that the number one hotspot at the function level is a method called handle message. We see in the first column that it has been modified 98 times, right? 98 times. So that means like at least twice a week, some developer is impacted by the excess complexity of that function. How complicated is it? Well, we can get an ID by looking at the last column, the column that says cyclomatic complexity. So for those of you who haven't heard about cyclomatic complexity before, cyclomatic complexity is one of those old classic complexity metrics. The way it works is simply that it's a function level metric. You count the number of logical paths for your functions. So if statements, loops, and so on, and you sum them up. And the lower that number, the better. Now, cyclomatic complexity, I have to admit, it's a, not a particularly good metric. It has fairly low predictive value. But it's very, very good at one thing. It's very good at estimating the minimum amount of unit tests you need to cover just that function. And here, in handle message, we would need 101 unit tests to cover just that behavior. And that sure says something about the complexity that we find there. Looking at the column in the middle, we see that this method contains 500 lines of code. That's a lot for a single method, isn't it? Right? You would never do something like that, would you? But still, 500 lines of code is much less than 20,000 lines of code, which was size of a total hotspot, right? And 500 lines of code is definitely less than 3 million lines of code, which was size of a total code base. So more important, we are now at the level where we can start and do a focused refactoring based on data from how we, as an organization, have actually worked with the code. Now, when talking about technical depth, I also want to talk about the people side of it. And the reason I want to do this is because Getting the people side of software wrong, I promise you, it has killed more software projects than even Visual Basic has. So it's important to uncover the relationship between technical depth and people. I'd like to start this part of the talk by talking about legacy code. Because legacy code is related to technical depth, but the two are not the same. So what is legacy code? There are many definitions out there. The definition I prefer is that legacy code is code that somehow lacks in quality, and more importantly, it's code that we didn't write ourselves. Right? 
And that second part is really important. So let me share a story with you. This is something that happened to me uh, five years ago, and I've met it several times since then. What happened here was that I was visiting a client. I did a workshop for one of their teams. We did a hotspot analysis of their code bases. And they had two code bases. So we analyzed them, we talked about them, discussed how we could address the findings. And then after a while, someone in the team mentioned that, you know what? We actually have a third code base as well. So I started to think, OK, should we analyze that one too? And everyone kind of looked at each other and laughed a little bit, like, uh, no, we don't really have to do that. So I said, why not? Because we know the third code base is a mess. And I was like, yeah, we really have to look at it, right? So we did. And we looked at the hotspot, we looked at the code health metrics, cyclomatic complexity, all that stuff. And guess what? Objectively, there was absolutely no difference in code quality between the first two code bases and the third one. And you know, when you bring up something like that, everyone starts to question it, that, hey, maybe the tool is measuring the wrong thing, maybe you are measuring the wrong thing, right? So we had to spend a lot of time actually comparing code samples, and after a while, everyone was fairly convinced, even though they didn't like it, that code base number three was indeed in no worse shape than the other two. So why did everyone think that it was such a mess? The reason, of course, was that code base number three turned out to be developed in a different part of the organization, in a team that has since been disbanded, and this team had simply inherited that code base, meaning they were now responsible for a piece of code that they didn't write themselves, they didn't understand the problem domain, and they didn't understand the solution. So it has much more to do with unfamiliarity than any properties of the code itself. And the first time I experienced this, I heard, I mean, I experienced the same situation with many teams since then. But the first time I saw this, I re it really made me think, you know, if it's that easy to create legacy code, can we build something like a legacy code making a machine? What would it take to turn your code base into a legacy code base? Let's do an experiment. Let's do an experiment on a different code base. Now I have been torturing uh, Android, a Java code base, so it's only fair I do the same thing to a .NET code base. This is ASP.NET MVC Core. It's a dynamic, it's a web application, right? It's a framework for building dynamic web applications. And it's smaller than Android, so this is just 350,000 lines of code. And it had had 180 contributors. Now, let me for a moment take on my manager hat. And let's say that I lose one or two developers. Should I be worried? Of course not. I still have 178 contributors, right? One or two people, it really doesn't matter. We can keep up the pace, no problem. Unfortunately, this is not what reality looks like. So what you're going to see now is another power law curve, because software evolution is full of power law curves. Software evolution is really full with Pareto distributions. But this one shows a different thing. This is not hotspots. This is offer contributions. So on the x-axis, you have each offer that has contributed code to .NET Core. And on the y-axis, you have the number of lines of code that they have contributed. So do you think it makes a difference if the two people I lose are part of the long tail, or those two people happen to be at the head of the curve? It probably does, right? So how can we show that impact? How can we visualize the impact of a potential offboarding? It's pretty easy, because remember, we are in version control wonderland. So Git knows exactly which author that wrote which piece of code. So this is something that we can accumulate, and we can use that to reason about things like knowledge distribution and knowledge sharing. So let me show you an example from ASP.NET Core, what happens if just one of the core developers leave. So, this is another type of visualization. It's the same visualization style as we used for the hotspots and all that stuff, but now the colors carry a different meaning. Everything that's blue, that's code written by the current team. And that means that if, let's pretend that we are an organization, right? If our code is blue, it means that somewhere in this room, some developer knows each piece of code because they wrote it, right? Then you see that there are different shades of gray, 
And these shades indicate that this is code written by a former contributor, so a person that has already left. So these are like our black holes in system mastery, right? And what I can do now using virtual control data by aggregating it is that I can simulate the impact if that one core developer leaves. And this is real data, so please have a look to the right here. This is the impact in red if just one contributor from 180 leaves. So let me rephrase that question. Let me ask it again. Should I be worried? Yes, I really should. So what would I do if this was a real world situation? Because there's a lot of code, and I simply cannot address all of it at once, right? So what I would do is that I would prioritize the parts of the code that are likely to need it the most. I would look for a combination of three factors. So first of all, I would look for the hotspot criteria, because if we lose knowledge in a hotspot, I mean, it's a hotspot for a reason. It's a hotspot because that code is relevant, right? Code doesn't just get changed because we want to have fun most of the time, right? It's most likely that if we worked a lot in a part of the code yesterday, we're going to continue with that tomorrow, right? So hotspot's relevant. If that hotspot also has low code health, high complexity, then I know that it's going to be extremely challenging to onboard a new developer in that part of the code. And finally, if the developer who wrote most of that code is going to leave, then I know that I have a real issue. So if I tick all these three boxes, then I prioritize that part of the code. And what I typically would do is that I would take that developer that's going to leave, I would pair them up with the developer that's going to stay, and I would have them refactor those complex pieces of code together so that we can mitigate an upcoming offboarding risk. And the reason I show this scenario to you is because I really, really want to drive home my point that there is so much more to code complexity than just the code itself. In particular, social factors like knowledge distribution influence how we perceive a code base. And I also want to point out that these techniques that I've been showing you today, they don't replace anything, save maybe speculations and wild guesses. Rather, I view them as a complement a complement to your existing expertise, your existing experience, so that you can focus your attention on the parts of your system that are likely to need it the most. And I want to make sure I leave time for questions. Before I do that, if you want to try this out on your own code, I have a whole book about these techniques called Software Design X-Rays. The tool I have been using to do all these visualizations and measurements is uh, CodeScene. You can try it out for free at codesyn.com. There's even a free community edition that you can use. And uh, I blog regularly about this stuff at codesyn.com and my private blog, adamthornhill.com. Now, before I take questions, let me take this opportunity and say thanks a lot for listening to me, and may the code be with you. Thank you.